So the message is Satan doesn't want Christmas to be as it should be in Matthew chapter 2, 13 through 20. So let me ask you before we go to this scripture, even before you start looking, so don't start looking right now. So um, I asked Trish, I, and we talked about, oh, by the way, anybody know why Noel is named Noel? When do you think his birthday is? He's born on Christmas Day. His mom named him Noel. So every time I sing Noel, I think I'm singing to you, brother. But I also thought the same thing when it said, and the dumb will speak. <laughs> Just teasing Noel. Anyway, so we are talking about some of our best Christmas. And, and um, I don't remember many as a, as a child. I, I, I don't know whether it's because of age, but I don't remember ever remembering many of, of my childhood. But I do, Trish and I talked about some of our favorite ones. And probably one of the favorite ones, she, th she mentioned the same one that I was thinking. One year we um, did a scavenger hunt. There was no presents underneath the tree, and our kids were little. And, um, but what was on the tree were, were one cue or clue, and it sent them to some place. They had to go find it. And when they found that, that's where that present would be. And then when they found that, there was another clue, and it sent them all over the place. And we were living on a farm at the time, and it sent them all over the place. No, I'm sorry, we were in the dorm. We were, yeah, we were, we were dorm parents for an all-girl college dorm. Good thing is, though, during Christmas break, there was nobody in the dorm, and so we had the whole place, and our kids ran all over the place looking for those clues, and it was a pretty good Christmas. The next year, my parents came from Tennessee down to North, down to North Carolina, and we thought we'd do the same thing. By the way, it doesn't work for old people. <laughs> my, my mom and dad didn't find any of their Christmas presents, and they're probably still hidden there in that dormitory somewhere. No, my kids had to go find them all. Some, there are some good memories about Christmas that you probably have. There are all kinds of sounds that the Christmas story brings to us. It's the, the shouting and the singing of the angels. It's, it's probably the sound of Mary going, oh, when one appears in her room. Um, there, there's the voices of Mary and Joseph talking about, you know, what are we going to do? And, and Joseph trying to decide. And I guarantee you, Joseph probably talked to more people than you and I are aware of. Because that was a big social thing about whether he was going to take Mary. Uh, there's the shepherds of the, the, the sounds of the shepherds and all the animals there, and there's all the noises in the, in the inn and in the city of Bethlehem. And then there's the sounds of the magi as they come running in. But in the middle of the Christmas story, we find this scripture. And like the gene genealogy, it's not a filler. It's not just there to fill up some space. And yet, I've seen all kinds of Christmas programs. It's interesting. I've never seen a Christmas program that presents the whole message that is found in Scripture, even the ones that are built from Matthew. This section is always left out because we don't think it fits. We don't want this to be part of Christmas. This section of Scripture brings up all kinds of questions to you and I, and we scratch our head. But we've been in church so long, we don't dare mention them or say them, but we probably have thought them. If we haven't thought them, it's because we read right past this Scripture and didn't really pay attention to what is going on. I want to talk to you about the fact that Satan doesn't want Christmas to be as it should be. And so let's look at Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 through 20. Now when they, that is um, the magi, the wise men, had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee. Not go, not run, flee. In other words, you run for your life. You flee. You flee to Egypt. 
<laughs> it's interesting. Very rarely, there are times when, when God's people are r running towards Egypt, but the word flee is rarely used in the direction towards Egypt. Usually, it's the word flee in Scripture is used in, re in leaving Egypt. You want to get out of Egypt. You don't want to run to Egypt. But here in this Scripture, God, God is telling Joseph and Mary to take the brand-new baby and to flee, to run for their life to Egypt. And you stay there. How long? Until I bring you word, until, this, until the angel of the Lord comes back again and says, it's time to leave. Most people don't go to Egypt for safety. Not if you're a Jew anyway. Stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to do what? To destroy him. To wipe his memory out so that there's no longer any memory of him, there's no record of him to destroy him. Do you remember why? What did the Magi say they were coming looking for? The king of the Jews. But that's not what Herod says to his priests and scribes. He says, where's the Christ is going to be born? He under, Herod, the Jews hear the word king of the Jews and, they, and Herod immediately knows and the priests know and the scribes know they immediately know this is all about the Messiah and every Jew is waiting for the Messiah except for their leader except for Herod Herod doesn't want the Messiah to come now. He probably wouldn't have cared if the Messiah came before he was king. He probably wouldn't care if the Messiah came after he was king. He just doesn't want him to come right now. You ever found anyone that's always putting Christ off? You can share the gospel with them over and over again, and they know who he is, but they really want to wipe him out. They don't want any part of him in their life right now. They want to be in control and in charge of when he comes. They'll even say, well, you know what? I got some more living to do. I, when I am old, I will make that decision. In other words, basically saying, I will be king of my life. I do not need the king of king to be king of my life. And here it doesn't want this baby to come in his lifetime because he's not done being king. He wants to destroy him. When he arose, that is Joseph, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. By night? <laughs> That's not a safe journey from Bethlehem to Egypt in the day. He's got to do it. He's going to do it by night. In other words, when the angel says flee, he means now. I, it, there's no conversation with, the Joseph, with Joseph and the angel saying, okay, I'll do that the first thing tomorrow. No, when the angel tells him to flee, immediately Joseph knows now. Let's do it. Get everything packed up, Mary. Grab that baby. We're going. Now, Mary has made some journeys, as you will notice. By the time Mary finally gets sat settled in Nazareth, she's made a lot of journeys, and none of them have been comfortable for her. None of them. <laughs> There is no dialogue between Mary and Joseph saying, well, honey, I just don't think this is the right time to be traveling again. Uh, if we wait a few more hours, we will be able to see the dangers along the road. There'll be more people out if we go. We got a baby here. You know that? We have a baby here. You know how vulnerable you are going to make me by sending me out right now? No, there's no conversation. Mary is never compliant. Mary is always submissive. How many times have you heard me share with you the difference between compliant? I do not want someone to be compliant. God doesn't want us to be compliant. God expects submission without understanding. When God speaks, he does not expect a debate or a period of questioning. The longer it takes you from when God says move 
the longer it takes you for, for you to move, the more you declare to him that you are king. Every time God says, I want you to do this, and you just keep staying there, the longer you stay here, the more you're declaring to him, I am king of my life. Do you realize that when, these, when the wise men and the, the scribes came to Herod and told him, hey, we've seen, he's, he's born, he's here right now, He's in Bethlehem. Do you realize that Herod at that moment had the opportunity to move in the direction that God wanted him to do and says, hey, you know what? I'm going to. But no. Herod from that moment made a decision that he was not going to move. And he was going to do everything he could to prevent the Christ from reigning. He is terrified of a baby not because of the he doesn't see the baby by the way he sees the prophecy do you realize that by Herod's action he believes more in the prophecy than the scribes He is convinced this is the Messiah. He hasn't even seen him. But he doesn't want the Messiah in his lifetime. So his mother, by night, departed for Egypt. And they were there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Are out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death. You hear that? Put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem, and what? In all its districts not district it's districts that would be like it be the child being born in Beth in Flintville and soldiers come in and they kill every child from birth to two years in Flintville all of Lincoln County over into Franklin County and every connecting county around us From two years of old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Have you seen that in a Christmas play? Most people don't even know it's part of Christmas. Most people that have been raised in church don't know it's part of Christmas. Verse 17, then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and it's found in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. That prophecy. We've, uh, several of you, through various things, either through on Wednesday night or some of the Sunday school classes, you've been getting some history lessons, and so let's find out how much you remember. So Israel was divided into two kingdoms after the death of Solomon. There was a prophecy 
because of David's sin, not Solomon. Solomon had plenty. But because of David's sin, the kingdom would be divided. Israel would be divided. And two new kingdoms formed, a southern and a northern kingdom. The southern was called Israel. And we get really confused when we're reading the Bible. When we read, I mean, sorry, sorry, the northern kingdom was called Israel. And we get real confused when we're reading the Bible. When we see Israel, we think it's the whole Israel. But actually, Israel is the northern kingdom. It was the wicked kingdom. Ten tribes made up the northern kingdom. Uh, they set up golden calves in two different locations, but they began to worship all the other gods. But the southern kingdom wasn't much better, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. The prophecy of their destruction was just beginning. Anybody know who defeated the northern kingdom? The Assyrians people of Nineveh. The people that Jonah had been sent to many, many, many decades earlier, they had repented for a period of time, but they came back in greater wickedness, and God used them. And they came, and they white marched in to the northern kingdom, and they took the ten ca tribes captive and scattered them to the ends of the world. The southern kingdom, Judah, remained Prophet after prophet kept coming to tell God's kings and rulers that God's discipline and judgment was on its way. But they did the same thing to those prophets as the northern kingdom did. They imprisoned them and killed them. One of those prophets was Jeremiah. And Jeremiah came and he told them, and he was true. The Babylonians come. The Babylonians marched into the southern kingdom, into Judah. And this scripture is recorded. Now, in Psalms, we find this talked about as well. But both from the, the, the Assyrians as from the Babylonians. You know what the Assyrians did in the northern kingdom when they came in? They came and they would take their swords and their knives and they would rip open the pregnant women. Take out the babies, grab them like they were a club with their feet and beat their heads on the walls of their own home. The Babylonians weren't any more merciful. They did the same thing. They came in and marched into Israel, into Ramah, and Rachel, the, the great mother, wife, the mother of Israel. They march in and they grab their children. And they do the same thing. They spare none. Those that weren't born yet, those that were born, they slaughtered. And the ones they didn't slaughter, they took away to spend their life as prisoners. And the Zach, the Hebrew word Zach, Zach, the Hebrew word Zach means to cry out. It's often found in Scripture. It's over 735 times it's used. It means to cry out. It's the 911 cry. It is the word that God uses for the reason he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. It does talk about Sodom and Gomorrah sin being great wickedness. But he says that the reason he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah is because the Zach cry has come to him. A 911 call for help came from Sodom and Gomorrah from someone who had been plundered by the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said, I'm coming and I'm destroying them. Well, the Zach cry came from God's people. From the hands of the Assyrians and from the hands of the Babylonians. But that's not the first time you find the cry. You find the first cry in Egypt. Where there was another king. Who didn't like the children of Israel. Who issued a mandate that anyone who was giving birth that all the male children were to be put to death. I don't know how many years that went on. Probably more than two. 
But the midwives who give birth to Moses or help in the birth of Moses, they don't do it. So Moses is hidden, and he is spared. And then we, we are introduced to it again in the middle of the Christmas story. With all the sounds, with all the joy, with all the excitement, with all of that going on, all of a sudden we are introduced to a tyrant, an incredible, wicked man who sends soldiers... I don't know whether those soldiers wanted to do what they did, but basically they march in like an army into Bethlehem and into his district, going from house to house, grabbing any one male child under the age of two and slaughtering them. And the Bible says that their cry, the cries of those mothers, went up to heaven because those children were no more. So do you remember when you first became a Christian and you read that scripture? Do you remember any of the questions you had but were afraid to ask? Do you even have those questions or do you skip over the scripture too? Have you never even asked God, why didn't you kill Herod? Why did you only warn Joseph? I guarantee it. Those mothers who didn't know about the Christ were asking where God was. They say that the only worst day in the calendar year for people other than Mother's Day, Mother's Day is supposed to be the worst day on the calendar for many, many people. The only worst day is Christmas. There's the empty chairs. Either through death, divorce, or some kind of separation because your kids or your family just aren't there. There's the empty chairs. And Christmas brings back a lot of grief for many, many people, and for this year, for many of our people. For many of our people, this Christmas will be one where they will never voice it. They will think, I wonder if this will be my last with Daddy. Will it be the last with my Mama? The older you get, the more you think about that, and the older they get, the more you think about that. So you try your best to seize that moment, right? For some of you, and I look around, some more of you, this year has been a year of loss. More than gain. It's been a very unusual year. A very hard year. You see, this is Christmas too. But before you begin to think that God must be incredibly cruel and just totally out of touch and a respecter of person, do you realize what he has just done? And God sent his son to die, just not on that day. He sent his son to put up with the likes of you and I. He sent his son to die from the hands of the same kind of people. Just not right then. He's going to die at a very young age. Just barely 33. 
He's going to die. God sent his son to die. That is Christmas. Now, why did he send his son to die? Because he loves. That's hard to find in the scripture, isn't it? He loves us. You tell those mothers that God loves them. He came to die to, to save us. That's what we usually talk. He came to save us, and we forget all about all the pain. In fact, even when we jump to the cross, we forget all the pain. The truth is, I don't know of a preacher or never have heard a sermon that really can unpack that. Because you know what? I don't really want to think about it. I can't unpack that for you. I don't know how to do that. I recognize that most of it I don't have a clue about. I don't know what it's like to be ruler over all things and then to come down and submit yourself to ants. You see, that's submission. That's not compliance. First point. Be warned, the enemy has always sought to destroy God's plan of salvation. Whether it was Pharaoh with Moses, whether it was the temptation of Satan with Jesus, in whatever way, whether it was the Pharisees, whatever way, God has always sought to destroy God's, the enemy has always sought to destroy God's plan of salvation, and he still does. So many of the scripture, the parables and the stories that Jesus tells remind us that the enemy wants to destroy what God's plan. The parable of the soils. He, he, he comes in and he, like a thief, he, he robs it before it can ever take any root. In Corinthians, he blinds us. He blinds the world so they cannot even see. He he. he messes up with their minds so much that they can't even understand. They can't even begin to know. And the truth is, all of us would, would be without hope if God had not sent His Holy Spirit to come in and enlighten, to open our eyes, and to just keep on drawing with us. And even though we keep running away, we keep fleeing from Him. We don't flee to Egypt. We flee from Him. The more we flee from him, it seems like he just keeps drawing us, drawing us, drawing us. The enemy has always sought to destroy God's plan of salvation. From the very beginning, the enemy wanted to stop Christmas. The Messiah and his coming. Second point. Be warned the enemy has friends who seek to destroy God's plan of salvation. These three points, kill, corrupt, divert, all comes from the story of a man that most people don't, may not remember the man, but they remember his talking donkey. And some of you are saying, a talking donkey? Is this a fairy tale? No, it's in the Bible. And the owner of the donkey was Balaam. Balaam uh, was some kind of prophet. He wasn't a good one. He was hired by the Moabites to curse God's people, to stop what God had intended. He told them he wouldn't do that, and he didn't curse them. But in the New Testament, we find out that he did something different. He came up with a better plan than just cursing them. He decided that he could actually end up having Israel killed or destroyed by corruption and diverting them. You know what he told them? He said, it's pretty easy. You've got some pretty girls here. 
you just send your pretty young girls down into the camp of the Israelites. I'll tell you what's going to happen. Those men are going to be strong, very strongly attracted to those young girls. Their heart is going to leave what is God's plan. They're going to think in their mind that they can carry out God's plan and love this girl at the same time. You're going to have because you're going to end up diverting them from the very plan that God has. And so you send your pretty girls down there because they're going to fall in love with them. And pretty soon, those young girls will control them. And you will corrupt all of Israel that way. And you'll end up killing them because God's judgment will come and God will kill them. Because those young girls are going to bring in all their lifestyles and all their idols in. And after a few generations of that, nobody will be able to look at Israel and know which, which God is which for them. And that's exactly what happens. God still has friends. In Jesus' day, it was, I mean, sorry, Satan still has friends. In Jesus' day, it was Herod. Later on, it will be the Pharisees, the high priest, the Sanhedrin. At some point, it will even be Paul. He always has friends. You think of someone. Oh, maybe you don't even have to think of someone. Maybe it's you. A time in your life where, and you really, you were deeply in love with the Lord and you were just running and running and running with him. And then maybe somebody even in your own house. Or maybe it was somebody in this house. And somebody diverted you. someone corrupted you. I have found for brand new Christians that sometimes their worst enemy is their spouse. Sometimes it's their boyfriend or girlfriend. Sometimes it's a brother or sister or a mother and father. It's interesting. Jesus talks about bringing peace and sword. Sword is in your family peace can be with him the only time you get peace with him is you have to reject the sword of those that you've been raised all your life not to reject that's also foreign to the gospel for most of us because you see most of us love our family more than we do Jesus. And that comes out a lot. Especially those who are watching. And I know what you're thinking. Well, he wants me to love. He does. He wants me to love them. He does. But there's only one first. only one first even in the marriage there's only one first and most of the time in a marriage where you're equally yoked you don't have to worry about which one's first because you both want the same thing the only time it becomes an issue is when when the other one doesn't want that anymore look 
the enemy has always wanted to stop what God is doing from the very beginning. All these lost people's names up here, you know what I should do? I should have you come up here and, and, and write on each of their name the ones that are trying to stop what God wants in their life. This year has been so long, most of us forget what kind of explosion youth we had a year ago. But I bet Adam and Cherie don't. Where a whole section of boys, men, filled up this whole back section for two, three years. But they became their worst enemy. They didn't need anybody out there to corrupt them. The one sitting next to them did it for them. And very few of them were strong enough We call it peer pressure. The Bible just calls it weakness. That is not just with the young, is it? Go to the third point and I'll show you. Be warned, you may be found destroying God's plan of salvation. I, I don't need the enemy, the Satan, to do the work that I seem to do very well. I really don't, can't blame my friends or my wife or my family or anybody else for what I do so well. I can't declare the devil made me do it. God has a plan for me. I know what I'm about to say. I've said it here before, and I know it doesn't make any sense. And, it's, and I know that the, only the truth comes out in the context. But my children know that what I'm about to say is true. My wife knows that what I'm about to say is true. That which is the most important to you is where the devil will use and come to direct, divert you. So on the mission field, the attacks didn't come against me. We weren't there very long and all the attacks came against my wife. The enemy knows how much I love her, how much I want to protect her. And the flesh came up in me. And God kept saying to me, you better remember who you are. You need to remember who you are. You need to remember you're not here because of your wife. When the two of us understood that, those th threats went away. Where do they come next? Our kids. And they take our son, 10 years of age. And they take him. And they take him out and they stone him. And they throw him into what was a pit for an outhouse. And they threw him down into that pit. And left him. Somebody came and heard his cries and picked him up. And when he walked in that front door of our house that day, I said, that's it. We're going home. And my 10-year-old boy looked at me, and I heard God, and he said, he said, Dad, we can't do that. I said, what do you mean we can't do that? I was still angry. Because God put us here. And immediately I knew it wasn't about my son, my daughter, my wife, about me. 
One of the questions I ask regularly when someone comes to me and feels like they want to do a ministry, I want to ask, I always ask them, I say, I want you to pray about something because I don't want you to do this because you think you need to be doing this. I want you to look me in the eye and tell me you are called to do this. That God has called you to do this. Because when you have problems with me, or you have any problems with anybody else, where it starts to mess with your family, you need to remember that the reason you're doing this is not because it's convenient and not because it's easy for you, not because it goes well with you. You're doing this because God called you. And you don't get to take your hands off the plow when God calls you. And you don't only do it when it's good. You do it all the time. Do you not understand that that is not just for ministers? That's for every single one of you. When you said yes to Christ, you don't just say yes to him when it's a good day. You don't need the enemy or friends to mess you up. We mess them up by our decisions. We mess them up by what we choose to have first in our life as our loves. We mess, we mess up his plan by the stuff that we make important. We mess them up by the stuff that we have in our closets, in our garages, in our yards. We don't need the devil to divert us. We do a good job at it ourselves. We all have excuses why we shouldn't be here. And I'm not talking about the sickness. I'm talking about somebody did something, they don't like it the way I did, or they want, you know, you know. If I had one prayer for Christians, it would be real simple. Help them to know that when they said yes to you, that they said yes to a calling to be faithful no matter what anybody else does. Let me take you to the last point. Be warned that in the midst of God's greatest works, there is joy and sorrow. The crucifixion carries with it the grief but it's also the joy because we know something about the resurrection. We know what's next. The coming of the Christ brings great joy for us. But not for everybody. Sometimes saying yes to him means that you have to spend your Christmas in the Middle East. Sometimes saying yes to Jesus means that you got to spend your Christmas in prison. Sometimes saying yes to Christmas to Jesus means that you spend Christmas alone. The world offers us many, many ways. To fill our Christmas with what it calls joy. And many of us will do everything that the world offers us. We are convinced that that's the way you do it. But you see, 
there'll be the day after. And you'll have to decide again. How do I be obedient to Jesus when the house is empty again? There's two times a year that I find myself praying harder than any other time of year. You know which ones they are? Mother's Day and Christmas. It's for the ones that sit among us that are experiencing a Christmas this year that they, unlike all the other ones that they've had in the past, This year it'll be Melvin. There's several others. I'm not going to name all of you. This Christmas will be different for some of you. I jokingly say this. I think it's jokingly. Trish probably would say it's not jokingly. I'll be glad when Christmas is over. the house is empty again. But Trish knows that's a, not really the truth. Because it might be like that okay the first day afterwards, but the second and third day she'll look over and see me in my recliner. And that box of Kleenex will be a lot closer than it normally is. I'm looking around, and, and as far as I can tell, all of you are believers. You don't need the enemy to mess up your lives. You can do a good enough job on your own, right? But the enemy wants to destroy Christ in you. He would love to divert and corrupt what he's given. But it may be true that one of you is a faker and don't even know it. You've been faking it ever since you got baptized. You don't even know you're lost. The enemy doesn't want you to know what God has done. He sent his son to die, to be murdered. Just like Herod killed those babies, he sent his son to be murdered so that you may live forever. Now, why in the world would you want to act like Herod and say, you know what? I kind of like being king of my own life. And I don't need a king. If you all stand, Father, I am very, very thankful for. I'm thankful for your calling. I recognize that your calling on my life is not anything that I'm worthy of. Like most of the time, Lord God, I, I actually show the world and you that, that, that I wasn't and am not worthy of your calling. And yet I am grateful. And I'm sorry for the times, Father, in my own life where I chose my will over your will. And I'm sorry for those times when I actually... Father, found myself trying to wipe out any existence of Christ in my life, whether it be in a little way or a big way. I ask you to forgive me. Father, I, I pray that you would do a work that 
for everyone that's on that cross. Everyone that we would ever put up there and, and say, they need you. For every friend of the enemy that is working against the very thing that you desire and we're praying for, I pray, Father, that you would free, that you would free these individuals from that presence. And then you do a work in their life of drawing that delivers them from them from themselves, where their old nature dies, because Jesus becomes king. I keep my hands on the plow. And may all of us be found the same way. Faithful to you. No matter what comes our way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.